The world has gone mad. In panic, they run for their lives. Some escape, but the town is ravaged. Thousands of friends and families are slaughtered. Does that I'm still alive? Over a half century later, survivors return to search for shards of a broken past, fragments of their youth, but to pass the story on. Oh my gosh. Their journey home taps buried pain. But the reward is unmatched joy. <laughs> Theirs is a journey to a unique place and time. To a town that is lost, it will forever live on. Major support for There Once Was a Town is provided by Judith Regina Baston to honor the memory of her father, Alexander Baston, and to celebrate the centuries of Jewish life in the shtetl of Eishishuk and throughout Eastern Europe. And by the William S. and Ina Levine Foundation. Additional funding is provided by Dora Dimitro, William Goodman, Michael Gould and Andrea Young, the Edward Novikov Foundation, William B. and Hilda Clayman, the Harvey M. Meyerhoff Fund, the Arizona Community Foundation, Rosalind Rosenblatt and Ann Maltz, and other generous funders. A complete list of underwriters is available from PBS. There once was a town known as Eishishuk, where Jews lived and thrived for 900 years. Three stories tall in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, their images create a soaring mosaic that celebrates life. For some, these were the last photographs ever taken. In 1941, the Nazis brutally murdered most of the town's 3,500 Jews. Fifty-six years after the massacre, several survivors returned to Eishishuk, willing to awaken old memories and confront long-silenced ghosts, to walk the ancient streets of their beloved town once again. Some have come with families from around the globe on a compelling quest. Zvi Michaeli was alone at 16 after the massacre. This trip holds the promise of a lifelong dream, to find the Christian farm girl who saved his life. A. Basner hid a sacred religious object minutes before escaping. He is certain it is still there. Reuven Paikovsky and his father fought as partisans. His father was killed. Now Reuven must find the grave. It is a very moving morning for us to be... For 20 years, noted scholar Professor Jaffa Eliach combed the world, compiling the long and illustrious history of her town. She collected diaries, oral histories, and the thousands of photographs in the Holocaust Museum. Torn away at the age of four, now it is time to come home. Eishishuk is today called Eishishki. It is in the southern part of Lithuania, formerly Poland. 
1941, its population was 3,500 Jews and 1,500 Gentiles. Today, not a single Jew lives here. This is typical pavement of a shtetl small street. And now we will have to close. <laughs> There's a gate here. I wonder how we are going to open it. And here is the mill, the Kuchevsky mill, built in 1930. And look very closely at it, and you will see stars of... After a flourishing history of nearly a millennium, there's almost no trace of Jewish life here except for Jaffa's photographs, a window onto a vanished world. The Yiddish word shtetl conjures stereotypes that range from quaint to romantic, to slightly odd, or worse. Yet it simply means small town. Yaffa's small town was dynamic, complex, even cosmopolitan. But shtetl life was a world apart from the mainstream, self-contained and rooted in thousands of years of Jewish tradition. They had their own schools, their own customs, their own form of government, and their own religion. Thus, their neighbors never thought of them as Polish. They were always known just as the Jews. By the time World War II began, Poland had the largest Jewish population in Europe. Most lived in the shtetls of their parents and countless generations before them. Children were raised with respect for the past and hopes for the future. The past could not be denied them, but the future would never come. You see, here was the market square. Cobblestones all over, filled with carriages. Yaffa brings her family to the square where her fondest memories lie. As a child, she was drawn like a magnet to her grandmother's side to behold the woman's magic. Alta Katz could make time stand still. She, like her late husband, was one of the town's photographers. Her house was also a pharmacy and a bakery. There were steps going up to the building, and when you walked in was her pharmacy. We used to go up immediately to the drugstore and always filled with people. But I loved to run to the third floor, which was the studio where Safta took her pictures on market day. This was for me Disney World. I used to sit there and see how they, they would pose for Safta. She would say, hold the baby like that and smile. Don't smile. She would give them instructions all the time. And then suddenly the bell would ring from the drugstore that they needed her to come down to sell something that only she could sell. So Safta, Grandma Alte Katz, would run down and the people would remain like frozen, you know, in the same spot. They would not move and they would look at the camera, but there was no, nobody behind it. And then after she would sell whatever she sold downstairs, she would run upstairs and take the picture. Photos that brought delight to a young girl's heart would become the legacy that preserved her past. She used to 
walk out here with us many times. There was a beautiful garden here, and many of the photos. In Alta Katz's backyard, the static images become infused with life. Yafa shares her memories with her daughter Smadar. Mr. Weidenberg was the head of the community Sheska! when the Germans came in, and he lived his brother. Sheska! So two brothers lived next to each other, and we used to run from Safka's house to them. Much in the yard is unchanged since Yafa's childhood, even more than first meets the eye. <laughs> Oh, she remembers my grandmother Kat. She used to come on Shabbat and light the stove for her. And she remembers the Mr. Weidenberg. And she remembers the, the, the bakery of Safta where she used to come and buy. And she remembers the, the house. The blurred memories of a four-year-old girl begin to come into focus. You know, I used to feed them. I used to feed them every day. You had your own chicken? I had been a lot of chickens. Maybe 40, 50 chickens. Ariel? A lot of the memories came back. I could see exactly my grandma. Uh, on one side of the street, my grandma cats. I could see my other grandma, grandma son and son on the other side of the market. I could even see myself running in the backyard, uh, chasing chickens. And now my granddaughter was running after the after chickens in the same in the same backyard that I did. So it brought wonderful memories of that vanished past. Vanished forever is the core of Eshishuk's existence, the marketplace. Until the day of the massacre itself, this was the pulsing heart of the shtetl. For centuries, the Thursday market was the economic lifeline for Jews and non-Jews alike. A Wednesday night, the farmers used to arrive in Eshishuk for Thursday morning to be in a good location, a good spot, you know. And they used to come to our house, the place to sleep, you know. And I mean, we didn't have rooms, you know, we didn't have beds, you know. So they used, we used to bring in straw spread out in our living room, in our dining room. And we used to have maybe 10 or 15, 20 people sleeping in our, on, our, on the floors. Each shtetl in Eastern Europe was the market town for its surrounding area. Once a week, the cloistered world of the Jews was transformed. Thousands of Tartars, Russians, Poles, Lithuanians, and Gypsies converged from miles around to barter, bargain, and buy. If you did well on market day, it changed your life. If it was a good market day, uh, it depends what clothes you could buy, uh, what kind of a wedding arrangement you could make. The market was the center on the economy of the shtetl, and of course it had a great influence on the culture of the shtetl. Leon Khan lived mere footsteps from the square. He and his mother Miriam could be at the market as early as the farmers. It was really something exciting to walk around, especially with my mom. I enjoyed going with her. I used to carry the basket, and my mom did all the buying and the negotiating with the um, Polish farmers. The haggling that was going on. Ten zloty. I'll give you nine zloty. Ten zloty. Nine zloty. Eight zloty. Nine zloty. You know, back and forth, and it used to go slapping the hand, and that could go on for, I don't know, five to ten minutes, you know. Jaffa's brother, Yitzhak Sonnenson, was one of Leon's friends. Horses and cows and pigs. With the cows and the horses and the gooses and that, it became, uh, it became like this day belongs to the animals. There were performances. They would set up like a circus 
and there were bears and people would dance with them. There were monkeys there. So my father would take me to that section and make sure that I don't leave him for a second. For centuries, the market was run almost exclusively by women. The men were devoted to prayer and civic duties. The struggle of countless mothers and grandmothers often did little more than put food on the table. They knew that market day could mean survival itself. So when the rabbi found a new husband for the widow, Malka Roka, she was eager for him to help out. It was for the first time in his life that he ever entered a store. And there was the scale, and she was telling him, you know, you will assist me with the scale. You will weigh whatever I'm going to sell. And she gave him uh, a few kilos of salt. Salt was extremely expensive. And he put it on the scale, but he didn't know how you weigh, though theoretically he knew about scales. But in reality, he never saw a scale in his life. He took the weight and the salt and put it on the same side. She was so upset that you can't imagine. She decided to close the store, and she grabbed him by his sleeve and pushed through the market and took him to Reb Zundel, the shtetl rabbi. She said, Rabbi, I just cannot raise another child. You gave him to me, you take him away. And indeed, a divorce was arranged. While women ruled the market, men governed the town. They collected taxes and raised funds for synagogues, religious education, and to help the poor. Women and men alike contributed to a bustling, vital life. Music, libraries, social clubs, and theater increasingly enriched shtetl culture. By the 1920s, the world outside the shtetl began to change. In the cities, Poles and Jews had an uneasy relationship. Some right-wing groups were calling for a Poland free of Jews. They instigated boycotts against Jewish stores and violence against Jewish university students. <laughs> In the 1930s, Nazi propaganda filtered into Poland. The few radios in town carried speeches by Adolf Hitler. But the shtetl elders remembered the Germans from World War I as cultured and civilized. Stories of Nazi atrocities were hard to believe. Unlike their parents, younger people were frightened. They wanted to get out. Many were able to emigrate. Zionists yearned for a country of their own and went to Palestine. But a few, like Miriam Shulman, had parents who did not understand. I wanted to go and my mother didn't let me go. She said, what will you go there, burn in the sun? You'll, you'll go to a paradise to to pick uh, uh, oranges, what, what, what will you do there? Is it bad here? We didn't know any other way. It takes a lot of guts and a lot of courage to get up and leave all your schmatters that you accumulated, you know, for hundreds of years because my grandfather, great-grandfather lived there and everything was accumulated in the house, to get up and pack it in three suitcases or four suitcases and leave the town and leave all your friends and all your relatives and so on and on. So the get up and go took a lot of doing and a lot of, a lot of, a lot of courage, I should say, you know. But I admired those people that left, you know, because, I mean, that was the right thing to do. In September of 1939, Poland was invaded. The Germans attacking from the west, the Soviets advancing to meet them from the east.
For two years, there were only rumors of what was going on beyond Aishishuk. Then on June 23, 1941, life as the shtetl had known it was forever shattered. The Nazi storm laid siege to the town. I will never, never, never forget the first black, big motorcycles and the tanks in the center of the town, Market Square. They went in like devils, with such a speed. And this narrow street, it was running like 50 miles an hour, with the tanks, with the, with the, with the trucks. And you feel with them like a cloud coming down over our head. And we didn't know what it is. We didn't know what a war is. We didn't know what it means. We didn't know what, what to believe. We know that's something terrible. So we, everybody ran to their house. I came to the house and my youngest brother was hysterical. For three months, the Germans shamed and persecuted the Jews without mercy. The first stage of the Nazis' final solution had arrived in Eschishuk. The plan moved forward. It was the eve of Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. And an edict went out that all the Jews got to assemble in the synagogues. They got to come to the synagogue, and if they don't leave the house, they'll be caught, they'll be shot. I came into the house, my mother had ready for Yontif, cooked soup and, and baked. And my mother put the candlesticks on the table, and she was going to light the candles. And it was getting a little dark, not completely dark. And I look out through the window, and I see civilian people with ammunition on their shoulders. And I, then I yelled out to my mother, let's run. I already was dressed for the holiday. I was wearing a blue dress. And my brother was dressed for the holiday, Yitzchak. And my father said, Fegele, I am going to save the children. I'm not giving them permission to go to the synagogue. The Yaffa's family escaped. Thousands less fortunate were locked in the town's three synagogues without food, water, or sanitation. After four days, more than 3,000 people from Eshushuk and 1,500 from nearby villages were marched to their death. Zvi Makeli bears witness. It's very hard to describe the horror what the Eshushkin people went through. In the middle of the grave was sitting, like I tell you, the German with the machine gun, and the rest of the Litvins from all over her hand with machine guns and, 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 and rifles, with the dogs. And it, 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 it was such a panic here with the yelling and the barking from the dog, this, the, 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 the crying of the little, the small children. I was 16 years old at that time. My father, the last word what he says, to me, Hirschke, do the slam, so it's not coming in. I say my father tells me, year 11, I must split it for a second from the dead. I saw already the cave in front of me. When he says to me, Hirschke, do the slam, I don't believe it. <laughs> but he says, okay. <laughs> The machine guns stopped the shoot. He pushed me aside over my neck. Like he pushed me in. He fell in the pits. When I lay there, my brother also, I didn't see it. 
passing by minutes a second. I told myself I'm not dead. It does that, I'm still alive. Fall with the blood in the mine. It don't think people fall on me on the side of me. Till I became heavy on me when I couldn't breathe anymore. I slid out from the cold. And I stood up when I ran to the bushes with not looking, with not thinking, with not figuring, with no strategy, just to get out. I think the same bushes are now witnesses. <laughs> And then after I came to the bushes, I look around back. The first time I look around, it was quiet, silent. We don't hear nothing like it wasn't before. People, children, live people, live people like wiped up from the face of the air. Beganeide te menuchatam Lachein balarachamim yastireim beseita kenafaf leolamim Veitzro bitzro achayim et nishmotehem Adonai unachlatam Veyanuchu al mishkavam b'shalom Venomar amen Amalech veint, amalech veint Umbadek dos groz mitoy Liebster meiner, liebster meiner, ich bin noch dir so. Liebster meiner, liebster meiner, ich bin noch dir so. Only a few hundred people survived the Yeshishuk massacre. Desperate, they ran for cover in the forests. The more fortunate found courageous Gentiles willing to hide them, though the penalty was certain death. Fugitives, the Jews cowered in barns, horse stalls, grain lofts. Yaffa's family found Kazmir Korkic, a friend from the market. He hid many Jews in underground tunnels. They were concealed, but never safe. Well, the life was exceptionally difficult because every moment was life or death. If you are not careful, you stand near the window. If you ju don't jump into the cave, if you make any sound, uh, anything meant death. And every day, Yafa, ואם בן אדם היה רואים שבא בן אדם לכיוון הבית, היינו מתחבאים. ושם היה, בבית היה, הרצפה הייתה מתרוממת, והיינו רואים שבאים אנשים, פעם באו גרמנים. נכנסנו בפנים, שכבנו תשע שעות. My father used to call it the heart of the cave. And when this was covered, we could hardly breathe. It was clay walls, and my mother would write the Hebrew letters on the wall. And this is how she taught me to read and write. And she would take my hand, and I had to touch the letters. So I learned a lot in the cave, a lot. It was my best school. The safety of the cave was short-lived. 
A neighbor was killed along with the Jews she hid. The Sonnensons quickly fled. They would remain on the move until war's end. After Zvi Michele escaped near death, he too fled to the forest. Now he tells his daughters of those who turned him away with, Jew, go back to the grave. In the dead of winter at a parish house, they were less blunt, but no more kind. It was such a snowstorm. Everything was frozen on me. I got thin shoes, and, and they were like iron on, on my feet. I go in this house, they have the same thing, the same house. And the dogs were barking. A woman opens me up. When I say, let me in, please, to warm up a little. She says, I'm going to ask my boss. Came out, the priest, in a pyjama, in a long uh, nightgown. So he told her, I, I cannot recall the name, how we, how we call her, what she said, taking the dogs inside because they're going to freeze. When he saw, when he saw the weather outside during the open door, taking the dogs. And I asked him, let me in for half an hour, half an hour to talk. He says, we can, I cannot do it. So I tell him, you have mercy for the dogs. You don't have mercy on a human being to let him to warm up. So he, he lifts up the end like this to God, and he says, there's Bosca Vola, that is God's will. Wouldn't let me in. Nobody no. lives here. Nobody no. lives here anymore. There's nobody living here. For Zvi, life was a constant search for shelter and food. I used to know sometimes by smell fresh bread. I used to break in. Still a bread, a whole bread. That's, a bread was about eight, ten pounds. I could leave it that for, for, for a week or two. After a year, Zvi finally found refuge. The Voyevodskis took him in. I grew up with the name Voyevodsky. The Voyevodsky family were uh, my father's angels, as he called them. For months at a time, Zvi stayed hidden. His secret was safe, even with the six-year-old who daily brought him food. Her name was Genya. She was so aware and so awake and so concerned about not only my danger, also understanding that they are in danger too, and still willing to help me. Hello. Hello. We are looking for a woman named Genia Voyevodsky. No, before she was Voyevodsky. Today is something else. Maybe she has a Today. different name. For years, V has wondered whether Genia would remember him. Now he knows only one thing. He must find her. It's Route 37 on the way to Asia Show. We'll find it. He loved Genya. He told me that she was shrewd. She knew how to keep a secret. I mean, that she could be trusted. A grocer's V reasons would know the people of the region well. Voyevodsky. Genya. Genya. Ona byla v té ty malá zvčinka. Ech, až jsem šla až jo, na zimě rád genia. Ona chybí bedže. A? Ona chybí bedže ta tunska. The shopkeeper knows a local woman named Genia who lives nearby. For a frightened young boy marked for death, Genia's family meant hope. Now she was the last link to his past.
Genya is the woman's name, but she is not a Voyevodsky. Not so easy without having a name. The, the husband thing, lately husband name. Otherwise, we would maybe find her. Pani, ja, ja tu, pani tutaj mi sowa. Tak. Stąd. Stąd. Bo ja szukam imię nie z Genia. The woman is not the least puzzled by the name Genya, only by whether she can remember where all of them live. <laughs> Zvi's search has widened, not narrowed. But as the challenge grows, so does his determination. The family has covered hundreds of miles, but for Zvi, the journey transcends all distance or time. It's waiting. There's Surka. Pani, a pani genia jest. Tak? Prawda? A to jest pani córka, ja się przedstawiam. Ja, ja Irzka jestem z Izraela, przyjechałem. Ty mnie pamiętasz? Pamiętam trochę. Tak? Ile, ile lat, ale pani jest... Ta sama dziewczynka, tylko trochę większa. Ile mam lat? Chyba siedem. Siedem lat? Sześć, siedem lat. A ja wyglądam tak, jak wyglądam, tylko starszy. Ten sam Jerzka. O, szkoda. Przyjechaliśmy i rodzice nie żyją. Tak chciałam zobaczyć ojca i matki. Ono takie dobre było dla mnie. 28 lat. Mama, jak nie żyje, 28 lat będzie mama. Jak marła. Tak. Gdyby nie mama i nie tata, ja bym już przeżył. Pani więcej. I, gdy, i gdyby nie ona. Ona no, no, noszła mnie do, do tego, do, do sieni, w jedzenie. I ja pamiętam, jak dziś sobie parasyl w rękę i idę. A tylko już kuli, szczeliają, mama tylko... Samoloty. Mama prędzej mówi, łoż się pod karita. Rzuciła mnie, Janka też. Tak. I sami pod karita leżeli, gdzie świnie te e, dają jedzenie. A pan Irsze byli w chlewie. Pamiętam gdzieś. No, jak Niemcy zachodzili. Czy ja mam basewa tylko. Ale ładna. Pani ładna. Tak, pani ładna. I thought that now we can rest. Like these people gave him the place to rest during hard times. It was the same thing. That now he closed the circle when he came to meet Kenya. And he can rest. For many survivors of the Eishishuk massacre, rest may never truly come. Some seek it by coming back, but at the risk of enormous grief. Many have never spoken of the massacre before to anyone. No one wanted to listen. Your father is standing right here on top of the bus. But there are unexpected rewards, joyous memories of a more innocent time. Eva, were these big buildings here? This building was here. 
No. You see, when I was little, I used to walk here to shul on my own. When I was even four years old, I used to walk here and I had long braids and there was a man by the name of Chinsky and then I used to walk into shul and jump around. He used to take me by the braids and pull me and said, you have to behave, even if you're a little son in the... If the marketplace was the heart of the shtetl, the synagogue was its soul. This is how it used to look. This is how this one used to look. The old one. And this is how this, the new base met. But Here the once proud building stood, grouped with two houses of religious study. As a matter of fact, this center of the Shulhoiv was the center of Jewish life. Weddings, all weddings took place Friday afternoon. The bride was walking from her house and was brought here with the klezmer. And the groom was brought from his house by the klezmer here. And everybody was walking with candles or with torches. Weddings had to be over by sundown, the beginning of the Sabbath. Throughout the shtetl, elaborate preparations ushered in this sacred, joyful day every week. Everything was changed. The houses were cleaned. The floors were washed. They, this, you could smell the, the fish and the, the food for Shabbos. We were all scrubbed, nicely combed, nicely dressed, and sometimes a new pair of shoes or sometimes a new pair of pants, you know, and just prancing around like little uh, princes. The whole family comes together singing Zmiras, you know, songs of Shabbos, and it was a pleasure to sit all together. It makes you feel, you feel you are one family, makes you a band. And then would come, uh, you would hear the sound that this is the beginning of Shabbat. In Shul Arayin, in Shul Arayin, in a loud voice, meaning everybody go to the synagogue. In Shul Arayin. <laughs> in Shul Arayin. At Shabbos, they have to go to the temple. The synagogue now sits abandoned. After the war, it was converted to a gym. But Reuven Paikovsky sees through the rubble to the house of God that once was. This is the shul, the Zuma shul. In all the time to have the ceremonies in Zuma. In winter, they were closed. This is the place from the Oren Kedesh. On the right side, it was the Roman. On the left side, it was the left side from the Oren Kedesh. It was the place from the Rabbi. The arm is for the women section. In the women section. This in the center, it was the women. But for laying the terra, it was in the center. Wow. Those are the shul. With their old shul gone, the group comes to the last operating synagogue in Vilnius, an hour's drive away. In modern synagogues, people come to pray. In old time, Eshushuk, they were there for just about everything. You wanted to find a Jew in town, you did not go to his home. You went to the synagogue to find him, you knew exactly where he was sitting. You wanted to see a public meeting, you went to the synagogue. You wanted to see personal discussion, you went to the synagogue. Everything took place in the synagogue. 
The Torah, the first five books of the Jewish scriptures, literally means teaching. The parchment scrolls contain the basis of all Jewish law. The rabbi was the guiding force of shtetl life. Most were chosen for their spiritual and scholarly credentials, their knowledge of Torah. When a new rabbi was elected, the entire shtetl would watch to see how long a candle burned in his window. If it glowed late into the night, they knew they had been blessed with a diligent scholar. The Hebrew language and the teachings of Torah were introduced to shtetl boys from the time they could speak. School for young boys was known as cheder. It would become their virtual home from childhood on. As they grew into manhood, their role in the community would demand love of Torah and of scholarship itself. Any father who failed to provide his son an education could be fined, or in the extreme, have his residency rights in the shtetl revoked. Many young men attended Eshishuk's renowned yeshiva, a school of higher learning. Attracting students from far and wide, it produced some of the most outstanding scholars of their time. An ancient Jewish sage once wrote, better the Torah be burned than be studied by women. For centuries, this mentality ruled shtetl life. Not until the early 20th century did things begin to change. Under pressure, girls who had been tutored at home were finally admitted to school. But at first there were conditions. If a stranger entered the room, they were to dive under their desks and hide. Gradually, they learned Torah, continued on to higher education, and many became teachers themselves. Today, knowledge of Torah binds men and women alike. This is the only shul functioning today in Vilna. And as you can see here, you have all the little shtetlach that were killed and annihilated during the war. But one shtetl is not here, that's the Asia shock. And she is not here for every reason we don't know. Today we got permission from the Gabai that we can put in the name of Asia shock. So with your permission, I am your representative. And I put in all the name of Asia Shock in your name. Nacha is a tiny village that was under the jurisdiction of Eshishuk. Abasner's family lived here. Their house functioned as the village synagogue. His mother Chaya kept the Torah in a cupboard, carefully wrapped in a tablecloth. Abe has come back to show his daughters and nephew his childhood home, but first he must find it. His brother, the young guy, used to go to school. Oh, my God. He, he went to school, school with his, his younger brother. brother yeah. oh, where, where is, I know. where is his younger brother? I, I don't know. 
О, вы не говорите по ангельску Нет, по русски? Да. По русски. Чей дом это есть? Ну, мы здесь живем, в этой, в этой половине. В этой половине. А вторая половина колхозная. Вот еще They live over here, that's have. Yeah. А кто там живет, в этом желтом доме? Ну, там наливайка. Там. Наливайка? Да. Это все, что я хочу знать. Yeah. Пойдем до наливайки. Вы идете там? This is a neighbor down there. Yeah. I know that guy. That's, you... is, that's is my uh, yeah. house. This that is your house? house? This is our house. This is your house? Yes. This is what you grew up in? That's what I grew up. With all those children? Yeah. How many? Oh my God! No. This is the house. Oh my God! Uh, let's go to, to that fellow in Albaico. I'll, I'll talk to him. Stop. Stop. Come on, don't cry. I had a vision deep in my mind that I'd find a house that my father grew up in and the house would have a white picket fence and it would all be intact and I could really see where he and his sister and his brothers had grown up with their parents and all that was there was a heap of rubble. This was the oven. Here they, they used to keep potatoes in that... Like a cold room. Yeah, cold room, yeah. Here seven Asners lived, and here the villagers came to pray. After the Germans invaded, they forced everyone from Nacha into a Jewish ghetto. No one knew that inside Abe's jacket, wrapped in his mother's fine cloth, the sacred Torah was safe. In the neighboring town of Raden, Thousands of Jewish families were crammed into three square blocks. The ghetto was a convenient holding pen until their execution. The Asners were forced into this house with 40 other people. Here, Abe's carefully guarded Torah was used in clandestine religious services under penalty of death. Before Abe escaped the ghetto, he hid the Torah in the house. If he could help it, no German hands would ever defile the sacred scroll. Good luck. Now he has come back to find it. When I left the ghetto, the last one from the house, I left the ghetto because my oh, three brothers they went to the woods already. Um, um, on, I don't remember why I left to stay another night. I, really, I don't know. Don't, don't remember why I not went together. And then when I took out my addresses and pictures, some that's all what I picked up. And then I saw this Torah is in our was in our place, in our possession. I took this Torah and I, from the beginning I said, "What? Shall I just leave this Torah like that?" And I said, "I can do that." Then I took this after I wrapped it up in a, a tablecloth and I saw it, a double ceiling. I pull up a chair, I stand up on the chair and push it in between the double ceiling. This is everything new. This is this the right side though, Dave? Huh? Is this the right side? In this area, that wall wasn't here. At the pechki, ne ne No, there were pechki, no, in other words. Not this This was side was higher. This was lower, like a So they ceiling. evened it out. Huh? So they evened it out. They they, they threw up some some plywood or whatever. If, if they evened it out, they pull it out. They could have gone right on top of it. What do you want me to do? What do you want? I want you to go in there. Where? Open up the ceiling. What are you talking about? It's easy. Put a hole in. Let's see if it's there. We're here. We'll give her money. What kind of hole we put it in? Bust open the ceiling. That's why we're here. 
I don't know. We got to talk to you then. Ask her. Ask her. Ask her how much. Я тут всадил таке Библия. Тут было отварта. Тут было ниже, выше. Это то они по бельках побили. Такие бельки были положены. Не было тут бельков. Было, что я жила. Ну, тут есть. Были бельки, они по бельках били. Так было высоко, где-то было такое шикатурное там, там был другой силинг, как стон-то. Так, так. Так, как стон-то. Вы хотите, вы сели за решите. Мы после сделаем как это все обратно. Открыть это столевание. Сталевание нету. нету. нету? Сталевание это подбито просто по бейкам. Диктой. Диктой только по а бейкам. Не буду. Не, не, не. Я в том году ремонт не делаю. Что? Я, я тебе... заплачу за все. А я, я не знаю, а я не знаю, 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 я мы вам заплатим за еще венце, только забачим, что есть. Нет, там нема, только я вам мувя так, как докладнее. This is the one that belongs to Canada. And it is an important thing in your life. And you just want to... I'm not telling you anything, so we... Okay. That's enough. All right. It's enough. Okay. I'm, I'm a little bit... I got my own mind, too. All right. When I... I have my own... I understand. Okay, so let's just... When I'm not... A puppet to turn me on. All right, let's... Okay. I try and it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Bye-bye. No. Do we say anything? Do we say anything? Do we say anything? Well, that's the, that's the way it is. She's not allowing to, to do it. We've got it in the house. Try. Try. She, she, she doesn't want it. Abe leaves with the prayer that the Germans never got the Torah, that it rests where he left it, in his mother's heirloom linen, in the dark and silent walls. In May 1942, over 2,100 Jews were killed in Raden. Abe escaped and joined his brothers in the forest. They fought with the Soviet Red Partisans, one of the many underground guerrilla groups battling the Nazis. The brothers became brilliant spies, armed with rifles, a mission, and vengeance in their hearts. They were transformed into warriors. All except for Abe were killed. Ruven Pajkowski and his father also joined the Red Partisans. These Jewish soldiers faced many enemies, not just the Germans. Polish partisans attacked Jews for siding with the Soviets. Right-wing Poles killed them simply because they were Jews. For two years, Reuven and his father, Shmuel, fought together in the forests. They made this encampment home, and it was here that Reuven received his education. They would lie in a bunker for hours while Shmuel spun tales of their shtetl, Eshishuk. How the dead would rise from the cemetery at midnight to go to synagogue. 
about the madman, Nachum the Pope. Every shtetl had its madman. With gunfire all around them, young Reuven clung to his father's words. Two weeks before liberation, Shmuel was sent miles away on a mission from which he never returned. Reuven was a boy of 17 when his father was killed. He was the sole surviving member of his family. Since then, he has been searching for his father's remains. After many trips to Eishishuk, he has located the farmer who buried his father and remembers the grave. אבל זה גם כן בא מתוצאות של הפולנים. אז כשהם שם שכבו הרוגים, אז אני כל הזמן היה אצלי איך להגיע לקבר של אבא שלי. His son Zaev and granddaughter Deganit are documenting the search. I asked him what did he feel when he was told that his father had been killed. And he said, what is it to tell? I went into my tent and I sat on my bed and I thought I had no life. He finally realized that he had no one left for him and I think he was lost. <laughs> You have to remember that a part of his family died without having any grave in the concentration camps, killed and gassed and then burned, and you don't have any grave or anything. And I think that if he would find the body or the bones of his father, it would be much better for him to close this circle. It has been said that Holocaust survivors always carry their dead martyrs in their arms. Giving his father a proper burial might bring Reuven closure at last. The grave is empty, plundered. Even the farmer cannot explain. Reuven vows he will keep coming back until he finds his father's remains. His granddaughter suspects the real reason why. He will never find the thing that he's looking for. He's not looking for a grave. I think he's looking for his family. I think that each time he goes back, he's convinced that when he will come to Aishishok, pass through the bridge, his family will come to him. In the summer of 1944, advancing Soviet troops liberated much of Eastern Europe. Now the communists ruled Poland, and the Polish underground battled for control. 
In Eshishuk, Jews slowly, cautiously began to return, wondering if it was safe. A little more than two dozen survivors came back to their former shtetl. The Poles couldn't believe their eyes. Some were crying. They were really uh, so emotional that they saw that we are alive and, and were even hugging us and kissing us and saying, we never, never believed that you will survive. Others were standing and said, too many of you came back. Hitler, good, Juden, kaput. Hitler is good, Jews should be killed. It appeared the Jews had risen from the dead to reclaim their town. Tensions ran high. Afraid, the survivors grouped together into two main houses. One had belonged to Jaffa's grandmother. Three months later, a neighbor warned Miriam Shulman about a rumor she thought the Jews should hear. She said, I want you to be aware. There is a group of white Poles that they don't want you. And they'll kill you. Miriam ran to tell Jaffa's mother, Fegula. And she said, you must be crazy. Something happened to you. Who's going to kill us? Why? Yafa's father chose caution. He asked the Russians for protection. A Soviet captain slept in the house with another soldier stationed outside. Late that night, Miriam and others heard the sharp clack of army boots. Members of the Polish Home Army were headed for the Sonnenson's house. Then grenades, rifle shots, and the sobbing cries of Moshe Sonnenson. And I heard screaming. So I got out, and there was Moshe screaming. They killed my Fagala. They killed my Fagala. Yaffa was a witness to her mother's death. This is her first time back in 53 years. Oh my gosh. Look at the stairs. This is the door. Oh my gosh. Well. I was downstairs, sleeping in the bedroom, and uh, suddenly there was a bang, and uh, a grenade came in through the window, but my brother, Itzhak, pulled me out from the bed, and we ran upstairs here. And my father said we should go in here, and he opened this door, and he said to my mother, Fegele, you will sit with the baby in the front. So my father pushed the piece of furniture and he got in and with his hand pulled it. You see, it was much lower. The, the, this entrance was lower than it is now, the door. And he pushed it against this and he pulled and he closed the, wing, the door from the inside. And he sat, he sat at the very edge and my mother was here in the front. He, she, he felt that with the baby in her arms, she needs the most space. And therefore, he was there. And we heard them suddenly, and the steps made a noise, and we heard them come and come and come closer, and we heard them walk here and walk in the other room, and they were walking around, and we heard them opening and pushing here and pushing furniture around. And then one of them said, there is a scratch on the floor. And he followed the scratch and he said, it's with the piece of furniture that was put here. And he moved the furniture to this side. He moved it here to this side. And pushed the door open and my mother walked out with the baby in her arms. And I was just in back of her. I could see their legs, three people, and they were the Burak 
sons, the two of them, they, and he immediately shot my mother, and she fell here. My father crawled and picked up my mother's body from me and moved her on this side of this threshold. But somehow the baby was not in her arms. The baby fell on this side. He was not in her arms, but her arm was bended like this but the baby was not in her arms. And, and right on this spot, right here, right here, was a puddle of blood. And there was another one. I think it was my baby, Machaim's, because my mother's blood was here. And on what I was wearing, and my father, moved her body <laughs> and I came out and Yitzchak came out and my father moved the body to the side and picked up the baby and put him back in my mother's arms. It took little time. Put him back and my mother's face Look very quiet. And my father, he said, I want you to know my Nikinder. I want you to know my children. I want you to know all the people that I will not go to my grave till I will find the killers of my wife. And I will make sure that I will be punished. I will dedicate my life. He said, look, we were the only family for Meishi Shok who survived. And he looked to heaven and said to God, God, where were you? When they finished the last family in Eishishok, where were you, God? God, who's been still? Where are you? Jaffa has accused the Polish Home Army of deliberately attacking the Jews, killing her mother and brother. But Polish historians disagree. They claim that the Polish Home Army came to kill the Soviet soldiers, that her mother was just caught in the crossfire. Jaffa believes her mother's killers live in town. She wants to find them to confirm the truth. One man is willing to admit the killers were Poles, but certainly not army. He said, that indeed Paul killed my mother, and he gave the names of the people. But they were not members of Army Akraiova. They, they were served in the Polish army, but they were bandits and hooligans. It does not take long for Jaffa to learn that the accused men are dead. But her presence collides with Polish memory, opening a deep and troubled wound. Tu cementerz jest żydowski, 
that all yeah, against me to, to, to that Panie. I am telling. You see, they just published the paper now Jaka in honor nieprawda. of my coming that everything that I'm Jaka telling wszystko, is wszystko not true. Na Ile... She, we know everything. Soon an irate crowd gathers in the market square. He said that I wrote in the entire world the Jews, that the Poles killed my mother. It's not true. Only Lithuanians killed Jews. No, but a Kofti ubili moja mamusia. Poshli vajna. It's a Kofti when the angry voices fade, there remains one indisputable truth. After the war was over, an estimated 1,000 Jews were killed in Poland in anti-Semitic violence. At the same time, some Jewish survivors from Eishishuk sought revenge to punish those who had murdered their families. We came up to his house and I kicked the door and he was standing there and he said, I did I had nothing to do. He right away started denying I had nothing to do with it. I had nothing to do with it. I wouldn't do it to your father. I loved your father. And so on and on. Anyway, I told him to say his prayers and I wasn't going to shoot him. I bayoneted him, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe 50 times. I really, really felt the time has come to pay back. I didn't do it enough, you know. I'm only sorry one thing that I didn't do it more. The desire to kill Jews from the Poles are so extreme. And I couldn't, I couldn't answer myself why. So I came to the conclusion Maybe this language with retaliation. They kill, let's kill them. I feel very comfortable what I did. And I don't did it not, I don't pick on anybody, and I don't pick, and they, to who I did, they deserved it, 100%. Historians believe such incidents were rare, but there are no statistics on how many Polish lives were lost. Two years after their trip, Abe Asner and his daughter Barbara return to fulfill a family vow. They must find the Torah Abe buried in his former ghetto home. It is all the Holocaust has left him. Did she agree with the government to do this? She was contacted with the government and she agreed to do it. Because the women refused him before, Abe sought official help. Now he has come with written permission from the government of Belarus to have the ceiling removed. Нам нужно только одну секцию оторвать. Надо одну. Где? Какую? Эту. Не, тут ничего по мне найдешь. Почему? Я вам подожил, не пальцы, сколько по ней. Почему? Вы же без обратно. Нет, 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 нет. Пан, пан тут жил. И строил. Нет, нет, нет. And 
I look across the window on I push it in was the opening down there. If it's not there, nothing there. What about over here? Could it be over there? We'll try, we'll try. Which way did you when you push, think of which way you pushed. You push it in straight down there. To the east. I'll, maybe I'll go up and take a look. No, 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 you're not. Nothing down there? The beam is down there. It couldn't go any farther down there. You just across the window. That's, if he's not here, you don't have any place to, else to look. If somebody took it out and pulled it someplace else, I don't know that. Or if they took it out, they took it out. I believe, I find it. Whether the Torah was brutally shredded by Nazis or casually discarded by construction workers, Abe Asner's search is over. That's all, that's all we can do. It's 55 years, they do everything. On, uh, I try. I try, that's it. Doesn't work out, doesn't work out. <laughs> Like Abe's Torah, the shtetl Eishishuk is gone. But its memory is preserved with the survivors and with the families who at last can begin to understand. The saga of Eishishuk will not die. The stories will echo for all time. There once was a town known as Eishishuk, where Jews lived and thrived for 900 years. video of There Once Was a Town, please call 1-800-343-4727 or write to the address on your screen. Major support for There Once Was a Town was provided by Judith Regina Baston to honor the memory of her father, Alexander Baston, and to celebrate the centuries of Jewish life in the shtetl of Eishishuk and throughout Eastern Europe. And by the William S. and Ina Levine Foundation. Additional funding was provided by Dora Dimitro, William Goodman, Michael Gould and Andrea Young, the Edward Novikov Foundation, William B. and Hilda Clayman, the Harvey M. Meyerhoff Fund, the Arizona Community Foundation, Rosalind Rosenblatt and Ann Maltz, and other generous funders. A complete list of underwriters is available from PBS.
This is PBS. For more information about Jewish life and culture in Eastern Europe, read There Once Was a World, a 900-year chronicle of the shtetl of Eishishuk by Yaffa Eliach. Now available in bookstores.